Uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be invited to be part of this uh, fantastic uh, uh, meeting today. Uh, I'll, um, the topic of my presentation uh, concerns the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East region uh, shown in the map, uh, part of it. It's a climate hotspot by all, uh, it's a robust uh, prediction, everybody agrees with it. Uh, Cyprus and our institution, the Cyprus Institute, are located there. We are in, in the center there. Actually, Cyprus is the only European and EU country that is located in the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East region. Uh, these maps uh, demonstrates a uh, geopolitical setting which is important because not only climate but geopolitics here are at work. Uh, for example, you notice that Cyprus is as far away from Athens as it is from Baghdad and from Rome as it is from Doha or Yemen. We are really there. Uh, this region of the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East uh, has about 400 million people reside uh, reside there, 400 million people, of very diverse backgrounds, educational, religious, cultural, you name it, is there. It's a region full of conflicts and has been for a very, very long time. Uh, plentiful in resources and opportunities. Two-thirds of the planet's uh, uh, hydrocarbon reserves are located there. Uh, I won't, of course, uh, dwell on this, uh, but I want to introduce some uh, terms I would be using. Uh, this is from the IPCC, and the two scenarios, the RCP, the uh, Representative Concentration Pathways, RCPs, 2.6 basically is following the Paris uh, targets. RCP 8.5 is business as usual. We see here that the planet is going to get a lot warmer. This is from the IPCC. And very important for the region is that uh, precipitation in certain parts of the world will decrease, and the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East is one of them. And this has probably more impact than uh, high temperatures in the region. Uh, as you see already in the map, uh, there would be fluctuations when we talk about 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees uh, it doesn't mean the, the whole uh, uh, planet will get that. Already was mentioned that the uh, Arctics are moving faster, etc. So uh, looking at a specific area, we'll see a lot of differences, and I'll focus on a particularly critical, not only for the region, for, but for the entire international community uh, area. Uh, here is a higher resolution uh, downscaling uh, done by our modeling group at uh, the Cyprus Institute is very recent, just uh, released uh, two months ago. Uh, it's a very comprehensive uh, ensemble of 288 solutions. And again, we see two scenarios. What is happening in the Mediterranean and the, in particular in the Eastern Mediterranean area? By the mid and end of the century. Uh, on the Paris, I'll call it the RCP 2.6, the Paris scenario, we see that in the area, even at the end of the century, will be lots of parts of uh, this area will be exceeding two degrees. Uh, in the business as usual scenario, it's just catastrophic. We see increases in excess of five degrees uh, in the area. Uh, if we look at uh, the emission contribution of the area, is significant but not dominant. Uh, you see hotspots around the Nile Delta, uh, near Istanbul, uh, Baghdad, etc. The What is more interesting is the emission trends of this area are on the increase, have been on the increase, very different from Western Europe, and they will continue to increase. The challenge, all almost all climate models predict that the Eastern Mediterranean Middle East region will be affected very adversely by climate change. Extreme weather, principally heat waves, shortage of water, shortage of electricity, health risk factors, agriculture and tourism may be at real risk, leading to 
uh, all the above to a possible economic collapse, not in the so distant future, which raises really deep security uh, issues and mass migration, probably the tens of millions. So what do we do about it? Well, first, uh, let's see the magnitude of the problem. The, again, referring to this uh, recent modeling, uh, we see that the temperature changes uh, depend here, three scenarios are, are, are shown, uh, the Paris and intermediate and the business as usual, and you see the red one, the business as usual is truly catastrophic for the area. Uh, and uh, the, this is uh, the four panels concern uh, the four uh, as shown in the insert, the uh, north, south, uh, east and west uh, Mediterranean. So the bottom right panel uh, concerns the southeastern Mediterranean. And you see there the, um, the trends are among the worst. If we look at uh, similar uh, modeling for precipitation out of the same uh, models, we see that uh, what is very interesting that uh, we have in the southeastern Mediterranean larger um, uh, trends in reduction of rainfall, an area which is already water uh, deprived and stressed. And even in the, uh, uh, the 2.6 scenario, the Paris scenario, we see that we have large projected decreases even with this uh, scenario, which is really catastrophic. Any other is, is, is beyond uh, uh, imagination what will be the implications, but even in the stabilization scenario, we see uh, a substantial decrease in rainfall. This is very important. So uh, how does this uh, uh, do with the water budget? For that was an excellent study from the World Bank that uh, here it shows till the mid of the century, 2050. The, and you see in the, uh, uh, in the bottom, uh, the blue band is, is the demand that cannot be uh, addressed. Depending on the scenario you take out of this model, there will be about 25 to 50% of the more total demand for the area that we don't know how to meet. It's just that bad, and this is not end of the century. It's only 30 years away. Uh, I want to point that in this part of, of the world, which has, is the cradle of civilization, uh, the Stone Age agriculture uh, alluded earlier, started there. Uh, there have been many wars, none of them for electricity so far, but many about water. Um, so, also this area of 400 million is highly urbanized and uh, like the rest of the world, it keeps getting more urbanized. Also the modeling for the city temperatures is uh, grim. You see some major cities in the area and notice that the number of total hot days per year increases not by so 50 or 80%, as much as eightfold or fivefold. And this will put tremendous stresses in the uh, uh, habitat of these uh, places. And I want to point out that it's even worse. We are doing a better modeling as we speak because this modeling does not include the heat island effect, which will exacerbate the problem significantly, probably by two to three degrees over and above. Now, the challenge is met technologically, presumably by air conditioning. Uh, places like Doha or Abu Dhabi do that, but the demand on electricity is horrendous. If uh, you increase the, uh, the temperature by one degree in, the, in these uh, habitats, the electricity demand for one degree goes up by 14%. Two degrees will require 34%, and three degrees will inquire, increase the demand in excess of 55%. So there are not the technical capabilities, 
especially mega cities, take for example Cairo of 20 million people, uh, to provide these resources or afford it. It's a problem that, frankly, nobody has a any idea of this that I heard how to address this problem. So, to make things worse, uh, climate impacts on public health, and there are lots of poor areas there uh, which have no uh, system of public health, will make it much worse. Heat extremes uh, will cause cardiovascular and, and uh, other diseases, air quality, respiratory diseases, food and water, uh, precipitation extremes, waterborne diseases will increase, lower uh, respiratory tract infections. Dust storms are noticeably in the increase. Anybody who lives there notices it year by year that uh, uh, they are becoming more and more frequently and along with the uh, air quality issues, they bring uh, other kind of diseases. And last but not least, because of the climate change, vector-borne diseases are known to the area. Uh, dengue fever, uh, Zika, uh, you name it, and mal malaria, of course, who ha which has been there, are on the increase. For example, in Greece this summer, there were many cases of Nile, uh, West Nile disease, which was unknown 10 years ago in Greece. Why? Because the mosquitoes are migrating northward. Uh, so a scenario done by our uh, um, uh, modeling group in collaboration with Imperial College shows uh, w how this is happening worldwide, but you, you look on the right uh, left panel, uh, you see that entire southern Europe in a two degree increase will be vulnerable to all uh, mosquito-borne uh, diseases. So what is... Uh, if you take uh, the next, uh, and obviously in a way, implication, uh, the extremes, as we know, will become far more frequently. Actually, uh, a recent modeling from the same group shows that by the end of the century, if we take the uh, business as usual scenario, the coldest day of the summer at the end of the century will be far hotter than the hottest day we experience today. It's going to be that bad. Now, this will uh, lead to collapse of the habitats, as we have seen, will collapse of agriculture. And people, when this happens, don't just stay there. Instabilities trigger wars, but also mass exodus. So, in uh, published, refereed uh, journals, uh, some papers appeared that uh, show that it is reasonable or it is not to be surprising to expect mass exodus in the tens of millions. And these publications drew tremendous attention, originally in the scientific community, then it got into the mass media from Washington Post to um, BBC and uh, uh, Voice of America, and eventually the politicians heard about it and triggered a lot of interest, which is good. Although the conclusion is really uh, devastating. Uh, so, what do we do? Well, adaptation and amelioration of impacts is, of course, we need to do. And we have, and uh, we have seen it already, a reasonable understanding globally and uh, regionally there of the challenges. Refinements are really necessary and carrying the impacts to a more detailed uh, uh, and specific to economic activity areas is badly needed. But based on this understanding, we know that we do have the technology to address at least partially, if not totally, uh, those challenges. The market forces, even the market forces, are pointing in the right direction. But regrettably, at a much, much lower pace. So there is, you see, I'm a physicist, and there is nothing worse in a physics problem if you have very diverse and often competing time scales. 
uh, and this is a typical uh, problem of competing time scales when uh, things will happen if left alone will be different from the problem you want to address. This was already alluded in earlier uh, talks. And even worse, and particularly in this troublesome area where uh, conflicts uh, are as common as heat waves these days, not only political will is sluggish, but politics stand in the way because they don't talk to each other, nearby countries, often they're at war, and even they face the same problems. There are no transmission lines across, no common approach uh, to solve problems that would be far more efficient if they were addressed collectively. Well, the solutions are obvious. I won't, I won't have uh, time, and I, uh, they are known. Uh, already, uh, Professor Sachs alluded to many deserts that are not being used, and uh, there are lots of them there. Uh, there is excellent, uh, and this is the DNI index, the solar uh, index uh, suitable for uh, uh, solar uh, um, collection and uh, utilization. It's one of the best in the world, and uh, the penetration is very small. Uh, it's there. C is beautiful. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea is wonderful for vacationing, but it's a source of water. And uh, one of the places to get water, at least not for agriculture, but for uh, human uh, uh, utilization, is obviously desalinated uh, sea water, and the technologies are there. And there is tremendous technological progress in uh, seawater solar desalination. So you don't uh, do what is done now, burning uh, uh, fuels to desalinate. In my country, in Cyprus, it's horrible. We have tremendous desalination program, like Israel. Uh, all uh, except agriculture can be covered by desalinated uh, water, but it's all driven by burning heavy fuel. Horrible. It's 5% of the electricity production goes into desalination, exacerbating the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, there are uh, technological solutions. One uh, that is, uh, is being pursued is cogeneration, actually, which is ideal for this region, of uh, electricity and, uh, and, uh, and water, desalinated water. The advantages are many, I won't go into it. Actually, uh, uh, you see here a picture of um, uh, uh, Commissioner Moedas inaugurating a solar field facility to experiment with this uh, concept. Also, uh, solar air conditioning, solar climatization is technologically feasible, not used at all. Anyway, the biggest problem is not the technology, is getting the leaders of the area to cooperate on in a regional, but embedded in an international framework to, uh, to solve this problem. Uh, we, the issue of security and migration drew tremendous attention, which led to a conference we had last May uh, on climate change in the area. And you see here, I like this picture because the three gentlemen in the middle, uh, probably you recognize, is uh, Laurent Fabius, uh, the architect of the Paris Agreement, Professor Geoffrey Sachs uh, here, and Commissioner Christos Stylianidis, the EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis each one representing major sectors, the EU, the uh, uh, Professor Sachs' uh, role as UN, as advisor to the UN Secretary General on Sustainable Development and Climate Change, and of course, uh, uh, Laurent Fabius, uh, the bringing all the uh, culture of IPCC, uh, COPs, and so on. So the international support is there, and as a result of that, we managed to get the President of the Republic to announce 
uh, it was uh, actually there was a whole article in Nature about it um, uh, to lead uh, a regional uh, initiative uh, for countries to cooperate. One of the nice things after about Cyprus, uh, we mostly with a, uh, had an excellent relationship with all the countries of the area. It's a good convenient place, and uh, this is uh, beginning to take place by techno-economic studies which are needed. So the coordination involves techno-economic and political coordination, and the political is very important in the area. And the government of Cyprus uh, is uh, accepted to lead the, uh, the challenge. Get scientists to develop technical tools uh, and policy options, give a, a policy uh, portfolio uh, with tool, tools to address uh, the issues in a cooperative fashion. Engage the stakeholders and then uh, get the strong encouragement of international organizations, uh, leading uh, powers, especially you, religious leaders, and uh, um, particularly gratifying uh, to see how much uh, push there is uh, and uh, support from the Vatican and other religious uh, 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 leaders in this area. Religion is very important, as we know, in that area. So uh, the first uh, uh, um, workshop is happening in two weeks about the decarbonization, so the process has started. And uh, I'll end with this uh, transparency. Um, it is a region where the, uh, the challenges are big. It is possible to avoid calamity. It is very difficult, but it is possible. Thank you very much.